Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Rebecca Munnerlin. Um, I'm with the Prisma Health Media Relations team, and we are joined today with Dr. Helmut Albrecht. Dr. Albrecht is our infectious disease specialist. He's medical director of the Center of Infectious Diseases Research and Policy at Prisma Health. Um, you may have seen recently that uh, Prisma Health did uh, enact uh, beginning today of uh, some new visitor restrictions due to the uh, elevated activity of influenza and other respiratory viruses in our area. And um, so we're restricting uh, visitors age 16 and under currently at our hospitals. So I'll ask Dr. Albrecht to give us an overview of what he's seeing at our hospitals here um, in the Midlands and around the system and um, how we are encouraging folks to take appropriate precautions. Thank you so much, Dr. Albrecht, if you'd like to get started. Yes, thank you, Rebecca, and uh, welcome everybody and happy holidays. And with all happy holidays, we will get a significant increase of uh, respiratory tract infections. And not surprisingly, um, we've begun to see a major upward trend in the last two weeks. And um, you can follow this on the DHEC website. They're two weeks behind. We're seeing a significant further increase over the holidays. And therefore, today, as of today, we'll begin restricting patient visitations, but only of children under the age of 16. And this is really due to the increased rates of influenza and other respiratory illnesses in our communities and in our hospitals. We're doing this to protect our patients, their loved ones, and our own team members. Um, most of this is driven right now um, by influenza A. Um, influenza B is also way up there. COVID and RSV were high, are a little lower, but not enough to offset the significant increase of influenza in our hospitals. So we track hospitalization rate for these diseases, percentage of visits, um, to primary care or to our ER that are um, influenza-like illnesses, which is a syndromic um, compilation of, of all of these death rates and rates of positive tests. And just to give you a flavor, um, last week, our, our rates that were positive of people that we tested in our emergency room or in our admitted patients um, approach 20% for, for influenza A. So every fifth test that we sent was positive. And about a fifth to a sixth of visits to the ER are now driven by influenza-like illnesses. So this combination shows a significant burden of, of disease currently in our communities. And in accordance with what the CDC says and for us, the Society for Hospital Immunology of America, um, some of the things you can do is, is restrict patient visitation in order to protect your, your patient. Right now, the ER is not a safe place for, for visitors and, and especially children. And we don't want more influenza into our hospital in order to protect our our staff, our um, patients, and and even the visitors to, we've started to do that. That's not the first time we do that. Um, obviously, it was significantly more um, during the early days of COVID. We have not uh, um, started mandating masking. We recommend that. Um, what we really want to do is is for people to help us out and not to become a problem for patients that already have their their own problems as it, as it is wash your hands if you have sniffles or allergies or anything that you can't be 100% sure it's not covid or influenza 
don't come to the hospital. Um, if you come, um, if you have to come, please mask and and just do the right things with with our patients here. Um, that's a sort of um, an early introduction. And if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Dr. Albrecht, I'll um, chime in. Did, do you feel the this year's influenza vaccine is a good match? Does it mainly address influenza A, which sounds like the predominant strain we may be seeing? So the vast majority of them are quadrivalent um, vaccines, two for A, two for B. They are relatively well matched, um, but the influenza vaccination rate is not where we need it to be. Even if it's a bad match, we need to vaccinate even more people to make up for that. So overall, the, the problem is the vaccination rate, not the match. What would you say um, our status is right now with the number of cases in hospitals? Do you have a lot? Uh, are you seeing a lot of inpatients? Um, how is the inpatient population right now? We have significantly more influenza than than we usually have, but uh, it, it's a bad year for for these again. Not surprisingly. Um, and ten thousands of people over the the influenza season will die of of these illnesses. So we're trying to minimize this. It's not an emergency. Um, we obviously have ways of of mixing patients and and sort of stretching the our capacities out. But it's it's certainly an urgency. We clearly would like it not to get worse. Right. Um, is it too late to get vaccinated? Um, what is your vaccination advice right now? Um, absolutely get vaccinated. If you don't need it for yourself, you may need it for somebody in your community or your your family. If you can get vaccinated, uh, please do so. There's no live virus in the vaccine. And again, it, it's the best protection we have um, from this illness. Can you talk a little bit about the transmissibility of these viruses, flu and the other most common uh, respiratory viruses you're seeing right now? Our folks, um, tell us a little bit about who can be most vulnerable and how these viruses, you mentioned we're worried about people, you know, even in waiting rooms, if they don't need to be there, um, you know, they're, they may be placing themselves in a vulnerable position to um, potentially contracting the viruses? For most of, of these infections, the, the big three are now vaccine preventable. That's that's actually new this year. COVID, influenza, different types, and RSV um, are now all vaccine preventable, essentially. Um, they are all spread by droplet which is not the virus flies by itself, but a little spittle. And you don't need to cough and to sneeze them out. You can breathe them out and, and therefore reach other um, patients with this. They're, they're very, very transmissible. Um, the only thing that, that sort of stops the spread is essentially the immunity um, in the underlying population. In the winter, they survive off on surfaces better um doorknobs and stuff like that will actually in the winter become um, issues if the next person goes in touches the same doorknob and then touches their nose so try to keep your hands out of your face um good hand hygiene um not only if you go to the bathroom but every time you touch something before you touch yourself or or somebody else um, we do that in, in the hospital with, before we go into a room and when we go out of the room. It would be nice if our visitors did that too. And this would help in the community as well. Masking, if you are at risk, mask yourself by all means. It's not um, a sign of weakness or a political stance. It's a sign that you want to help out yourself or somebody else. 
And this way we'll get through it just a tad better if all of us can adult a little. <laughs> Great advice, Dr. Albrecht. Do you think that the increase that we're seeing in flu this year is a typical annual surge or do you feel like it's an unusually high surge compared to past years? It's for the Carolinas, it's a little on the early side, but over the last couple of years, this has been much more difficult to predict um, with the interplay of, of vaccines and COVID and, and masking. So um, this is not terribly surprising, but it's a little on the early side, typically, if it starts early, um, we have a bad flu season because it continues to rise. Two years ago, we had a very early rise and then a drop off after New Year's. Um, but until we know that, let's just all do the right things and try to avoid that. It's con if it continues to go up like this to our regular time when we get the majority of our influenza season is January, February. Um, if it continues to go up, uh, we have a really bad flu season on our hands. Good to know. Um, I know it's it's maybe a little early to talk about hospitalization rates, and you did mention that um, about every fifth uh, patient that's been tested for the flu, I think, has tested positive. Um, it's, can you give us a context of what the hospitalization rate is looking like at this point, or is it a little early to talk about that? The hospitalization rate, I can only say that from my personal experience, we're seeing a lot more patients while we are on service. Um, so some of these patients get admitted. The vast majority does not get admitted, right? Right. But it's... Uh, for, for us, it's, I think the death rate is disturbing, the hospitalization rate is disturbing, but the bigger picture is to get the community transmission down um, in order for our patients not to get infected in the hospital mm -hmm. um, while they're struggling with something else. Um, and our nurses that we need through phases of urgencies like this, even more than usual, we always need them, but uh, get less of our staff infected um, would be very much appreciated. But the right. hospitalization rate um, overall is, is really a function of how much there is in the community. There is much of it in the community right now. So our hospitalization rate is higher, not threatening, not not something that we can't deal with. Um, if we didn't have to deal with it, um, everybody would be in a better place. Let's talk a little bit about um, the new COVID booster. That's something else that um, I know we've been encouraging folks um, to do is to get uh, the booster for the Omicron variant, which is available now to folks. And are you seeing as much of that? Um, tell us a little bit about your concerns around COVID right now. Well, after Thanksgiving and in the early flu season, we had an uptick of COVID and we had an uptick of RSV. Both of those are a little lower, um, but again, offset by a massive increase of influenza that started significantly after the COVID and RSV uptick. So. If you haven't had um, COVID this year and haven't had a vaccine, this new booster will provide extra immunity. Whether you need that, um, you have to decide and what it's worth to you. Um, I got it and um, have recommended it for people who haven't had very recent COVID as another way of, of protecting your community and protecting yourself from severe illness. If you're going out to get vaccinated, can you get both of those shots at the same time, Dr. Albrecht? Yes, and I think RSV can, can wait if you don't want all three at the same time, if you're in, in a 
risk group that should also get a RSV protection. Um, the COVID and the influenza shot at this time, I would take them both. I take them both at the same time. Um, from the effects of the vaccine, you you suffer the same. You just don't have to do it twice. <laughs> gotcha. Um, what about, um, I know there are some age recommendations on the RSV vaccine. Can you remind us what those are? So the, the RSV vaccination recommendations are a little different. It's supposed to be, it's, should be over 60 and have something else. And that should be determined by the provider and the patient in a discussion. That's probably a little too complicated to figure out now, but in general, you should have something, some heart disease, lung disease, significant cancer disease, significant immunocompromise from, from medications or other things. Um, and it goes significantly up. Somebody 80 years old is a significantly higher risk at 60 years old. So for me personally, it's uh, 80 years and up um, and 60 plus significant comorbidity and willingness to, to take the vaccine. So basically check with your primary care provider and see if they recommend you do that. Correct. Got it. Um, I think we've asked all the questions um, posted in the chat. Any other questions that our media partners would like to send my direction? Um, thank you so much, Dr. Albrecht. Is there, um, here's a question. Um, when should parents bring their, well, I'm not sure um, if this question is about uh, when parents should bring their children to be vaccinated, uh, could our... No, it's probably to the emergency rooms or, or hospitals. Um, yeah, when should kids bring their... When should parents bring their kids in? Um, I think... Um, oh, I see. When are they... When they're sick enough? When are they sick enough to bring in to the ED? The, the significant event is, is shortness of breath. And if you feel that they're not breathing right and don't wait until they don't breathe and when they have significant problems breathing. If you can keep their dehydration um, level low, if you so if they can take oral, if you um, can manage the fever, if you can manage the, uh, the symptoms such as cough and things like that with decongestion or over the counter, medication most parents know how how to do that but if it gets out of hand if it gets severe and especially if their shortness of breath is is coming in um especially in kids that are at higher risk um bring them in urgent care or primary care uh, preferably if it's threatening than the er but not not everybody with the whole um, definitely shouldn't go to the ER. If they don't have COVID, then they'll probably have COVID on the way out. Um, so judgment call, but I think for the hospital side, shortness of breath is, is, the, is the ticker. Got it. Um, any other uh, closing thoughts, Dr. Albrecht, just uh, overall uh, good good advice for us? Yeah, do the right things. Um, wash your hands, get vaccinated, and don't go out um, to work, um, to the store, and certainly not to the hospital um, when you are sick to to visit your your neighbors or or your beloved ones. Um, stay at home and and cure this out before you. Um, mix with the rest of the community so we can get a handle of this. And it's not too late to get vaccinated, but the vaccination doesn't instantly protect you, right? It takes a little bit of time to kick in. So it you takes a couple of that. days, but, but this year's vaccine, I, I'm getting vaccine for, for myself and 
in 10 years when I really need it. It's it's really, it, it, it broadens your ability to generate an immune response and it, it prevents severe illness. So even if you get COVID, it, it'll be significantly less um, if you get it with on top of a vaccine, so. Do you believe that the COVID vaccine will continue to be updated on an annual basis? I think that's the, the current climate where we're clearly not there where COVID has evolved enough to, to be a truly seasonal illness like influenza is. But it certainly looks like that's going to be the way that these will up, be updated. If we have a new variant, totally new variant, let's call it Upsilon or something like that, whatever comes in the Greek alphabet um, we haven't used yet. Um, then the good news about these RNA vaccines is you can change them out within weeks and and sort of adjust to that. But bearing that that won't happen, that we will have a seasonal vaccine um, before the start of the influenza and COVID season um, to vaccinate. Next year, we will have combination vaccines. And at the latest in two years, we'll have a vaccination for, for all three um, viral pathogens combined in, in one vaccine, I would predict. That's good. That's interesting news. Um, well, we'll all keep a lookout for those developments as they um, advance in uh, medicine every year, it seems. So thank you so much for your work in all of this and keeping us informed on what the picture looks like this year. And um, I think that was, we've addressed everyone's questions. So thank you all very much. If you have any trouble with your recording, uh, you can contact me or Tammy and we will be glad to send you a copy of this. Um, we've recorded it on our side. So um, wishing everyone uh, good health and happy holidays. Thank you for joining us. Happy New Year, everyone. I'll see you next year. Thanks, Dr. Albrecht. Bye-bye.